Well, good morning. Great to see you this morning. Please take your Bibles and open them to uh, Galatians, Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. And we're going to be looking at Galatians chapter 4, verses 21 uh, down to 31 this morning. Galatians chapter 4, verse 21 down to 31. Let's pray together. Lord, we have asked you to speak by your word this morning. And so, Lord, we pray that you would do that. Even as I read your word, I ask, Lord, that you would speak through it. Lord, we need you this morning to open up our minds and our hearts to hear what you have to say. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to respond. Help us to live lives that stand firm in you, knowing who you are and what you have done. So Lord, I pray that you would speak. In your precious and holy name, we pray all these things. Amen. All right, Galatians chapter 4, verse 21. Let's read. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons by a slave woman and one by a free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through promise. Now this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. Now, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. Now you, brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. But just as at that time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, so also it is now. But what does the Scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. So, brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free. Now, as I read that passage this early in the morning, on a Sunday morning, most of us are probably wondering what on earth is going on. Because there's a lot of different images and a lot of different pictures that are given to us in this passage. But what this passage really represents is a choice. In life, every single day, you have a choice. You have the small choices that you made this morning. Will I wear this or will I wear that? Will I eat this or will I eat that? Will I go to church or will I stay at home? All of those choices that we have before us, the small, more mundane choices of life. But then we have the big choices. Where will I live? Where will I work? What am I going to do with my life? What will I believe? the big choices in life. And this passage, I think, Paul brings us to the place where we have to make a big choice. The choice is the choice between the slave woman or the free woman. The choice is the choice between the slave son and the free son. The choice is the choice between the promise and the curse. The choice is the choice between the present Jerusalem, or the Jerusalem above. 
Now, in order to get us into those choices, what Paul does is he asks a question, a leading question that leads us into the choices that he brings before us. Verse 21, tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? You want to be under this law. You say, I want to be under the law. But what Paul is saying is, have you not actually listened to the law? And what he means by the law here, it's kind of confusing. Sometimes he means just the shortened end of the law, like the Ten Commandments. And sometimes he means the first five books of the Bible. And what he means here is the first five books of the Bible. He's saying, you who desire, you want to be under that law, but have you actually listened to what it says? And so in Paul's tone, there's kind of this frustration that he has with them. You say you want this, but do you actually know what you want? Are you choosing correctly? And it, and it kind of reminds me of, of what happens to Luana and me when we get into a restaurant. I've told some of you this before, but many of you are new, so you mightn't have heard it before. Let me let you into my marriage for a second. We get into a restaurant. Here's what happens. She reads the menu over and over again. I know exactly what I want in two seconds. I'm just looking for the meat. And when I find what I want in two seconds, I say, I'm done, and I close the menu. And Luana asked me this question, did you even read it? Did you even read it? Did you even read what was said? The reality is, no, I didn't. I just saw what I wanted, and I went for that. That's the frustration that Paul has here. Have you even listened to the law? Did you even read the thing properly? You've just looked at circumcision and said, oh, I want that. You've just listened to the Judaizers who say, yes, you need Jesus plus food laws. Yes, you need Jesus plus circumcision. Yes, you need Jesus plus feasts. But what Paul is saying is, have you actually read the thing? They've just opened up the menu, said, I want that, and closed it shut. No, you need to read the thing. And when you read the thing, you realize that you have this choice. He's bringing these contrasts in the passage. And the first contrast he brings is that between the slave woman and the free woman. He says in verse 22, For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. So in the law, you have a choice. Who do you want as your mother? Do you want the slave woman or the free woman? Now again, I know. You know, this morning when you got up and you came in here, you're, you're kind of like, that's not really a choice I was ever thinking about. I didn't come in here thinking, should I live under the slave woman or should I live under the free woman? I don't really care about that. But Paul does. And God does because that is a very real choice that we have to have. Is it the slave woman or is it the free woman? And behind this choice is what they knew as a story. They knew the story very well, and we don't actually know the story that well at all. Because the story behind this choice is quite significant. The story behind the choice is a story of Abraham and Sarah. In Galatians, or in, not Galatians, just habit after a number of weeks, in Genesis, back at the very beginning, Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3, God comes to Abraham and God gives Abraham this promise. This promise that he confirmed in Genesis 15 and he confirmed by circumcision in Genesis 17. And he comes to Abraham and he gives him this promise, this kind of threefold promise. He says to Abraham, Abraham, you don't have a land, I'm going to give you a land. It's the first part of the promise. Abraham, you don't have blessing. I'm going to give you blessing. That's the second part of the promise. But the third part of the promise is absolutely ridiculous. The third part of the promise that he says to Abraham is this. Abraham, I am going to make you into a great nation. Abraham, I'm going to make your family massive. Abraham, you see the stars in the sky? I'm going to make your family as numerous and as big as the stars in the sky. Now, what's ridiculous about that? Abraham's wife, Sarah, she's barren. She can't have any kids. And yet God's saying, I'm going to give you a massive family? The second shocking thing about that promise is this. Abraham... When he gets this promise, he is in his mid-70s. Sarah, she's in her mid-60s. 
Humanly speaking, these two are not going to have children. They're not going to have children. It's impossible. That wouldn't be good family planning, would it? To wait until your 60s or your 70s. It just doesn't work. It's not going to work. And so this promise is ridiculous. And what they wrestle with throughout the book of Genesis is the reality of, is this promise actually going to come true? God comes to Abraham in his mid-70s and says, I'm going to make your family massive. Now the test for Abraham is this, will he trust and believe the promise of God? And so God comes to him directly again after he gives him the first promise. In Genesis chapter 12, after he gives the first promise there, he comes to him and reiterates the promise in Genesis 17. And I want you to listen to what Abraham says in response to that specific promise. In Genesis 17, the Lord comes to Abraham and he says to him this, I will bless her and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her and she shall become nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. Then Abram fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? Shall Sarah, who is ninety years old, bear a child? So from chapter 12 to chapter 17, they've grown up in years. Now, the promise is still there, and Abraham is in his hundreds, and she is in her nineties, and he is listening to the Lord give him this promise, and he actually laughs at the Lord. He falls down on his face, and he laughs. That's his response to the promise. And then, I want you to hear Sarah's response to the promise. Sarah, she's listening in. She's overhearing the Lord talk to Abraham. She's being a little bit nosy. And in Genesis chapter 18, it says this, The Lord said to Abraham, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. No one, humanly speaking, knew she was listening. Now Abraham and Sarah were advanced in years. The way of the woman had ceased to be with Sarah. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I am worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have such pleasure as a child? They hear the promise of God. What do they do? They laugh. Abraham hears it. He laughs. Not a chance. I'm a hundred years old. This is not happening, God. Sarah hears the promise. Not a chance. I'm 90 years old. This isn't happening, Lord. You made us as people. You know this isn't going to work. So they hear this promise and they doubt it. And what happens to us when we doubt that God is going to do something? Do you know what happens when we doubt that God is going to do something? We don't believe him. We don't trust them. And you know what we try and do? We try and take things into our own hands. God, you can't do it. So guess what, God? I'm going to do it. Because, you know, I know you're the creator of the universe. I know you've given me a promise. But, Lord, I know what's best. So I'm going to take things into my own hands. And that's what Abraham and Sarah do. In Genesis chapter 16, we are told they knew of this promise they knew of this child, but they took things into their own hands. And what did Sarah do? She got her slave servant, Hagar. She was an Egyptian. Gets the slave servant, says to Abraham, let's make our family. Here's what you do. Take Hagar, go and be with her, sleep with her, and let's make a family. Do you know what Abraham says? The passage says that Abraham said nothing. He was silent. Just as Adam was silent in the garden. Nothing. Takes Hagar and sleeps with her. This is the story of the two women. This is the choice that we have. Do we live under the slave woman of Hagar or do we live under the free woman of Sarah. 
That's the choice that we have this morning. He puts it another way in the passage, verse 23. But the son of the slave woman was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through the promise. That's the next choice. You have the slave woman or the free woman, and then you have the slave son or the free son. Who's the slave son is Ishmael, the son born to Hagar. Or the, or the free woman, the son born to the free woman is Isaac. Who do you want as your mother? Now who do you want as your brother? Which family do you want to have? Do you want Ishmael as your brother or do you want Isaac as your brother? When Isaac was born, the promises of God were fulfilled and they called his name Isaac, which means one who laughs because they realized that the Lord had fulfilled his promise. What are you going to live under? That is the choice. And the third option that's given in verse 23 is this. Either you choose the flesh or you choose the promise. So either you choose the slave woman or the free woman. Either you choose the slave son or the free son. Or what it ultimately boils down to is this. This is what he's getting to. Either you choose the flesh or the promise. Either you choose to take things into your own hands, as we often do in our lives, or we trust in God that He is good, and He will do what is right, and we can trust in His promise. And that is a choice that we as Christians have every single day. You as a Christian, you have a choice. Am I going to live according to the flesh, or am I going to live according to the promises of God? Am I going to try and take things into my own hands and earn my salvation by works? Or am I going to seek to earn my salvation by faith alone in Christ alone? What way am I going to live? And often we are tempted to try and take things into our own hands, aren't we? We look at our children, for example, and we say, they're not Christians. They don't trust in the Lord. So what I'm going to try and do is, is force this thing and make this thing happen. I'm going to help them along and make them make a decision to trust in Christ. I'm going to push them forward. And yes, we need to preach Christ to our children, but no, we cannot save them. It is the Lord who saves. So either we try and take things into our own hands or we trust in a God who saves. It would be the same thing for the husband who has a wife who does not believe. We can try and force her hand and try and make things happen, or we can try and pray and trust in the Lord to bring about his salvation because the Lord, he is really good at saving people and he will ultimately do it. This verse says we have a choice. Do we live by the flesh or do we live by the promise? Sometimes there's people in our lives, they let us down. They disappoint us. We have these high expectations of people in our lives. Do you have expectations of people? We all have high expectations. I had an expectation shock in my life. We were, our first flight, our first 10, 8 hour flight with kids, I, I brought my book onto the flight and, and, and opened up the book, it was with the Talitha, and, and I opened up the book at the start of the flight, and guess what happened? She started crying. I closed up the book, and I thought to myself, I am never going to read a book for, on a plane for a number of years. Expectations. Sometimes you go into a place, or you have a relationship, and you have expectations that are not met. Sometimes we wish our husband would be more godly, or that our wife would be more godly. And we try and make these things happen. We try and create in them who we want them to be. Try and take things into our own hands. We pull a Sarah on it. Sarah in the scripture, not Sarah here. <laughs> we pull a Sarah on it. We try and control it, don't we? How about we leave it up to God? 
How about we hand over the people that we love over to God and leave Him do the work of change in their life? That's the choice we have each day. The choice between the flesh and the promise. And there is more choices that he reveals in this passage, and I won't go through every verse, I assure you, this morning, but let me just read to you and and show you one more choice from verse 24 down to verse 27. Let's read it again. Now, this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. Now, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But Jerusalem above is free. She is her mother, for it is written, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor, for the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. You have a choice between the slave woman and the free woman. You have a choice between the slave son and the free son. You have a choice between the flesh and the promise. And this passage, it reveals to us more choices. You have a choice between two covenants, the old covenant and the new covenant. You have a choice between Hagar on Mount Sinai, or you have a choice between Sarah who has been given the promise. And finally, you have a choice, verse 25 and 26, you have a choice between the present Jerusalem and the Jerusalem above. Now, I'm not going to go into all those choices, but I want you to focus on this. When we open up the menu, Paul is saying, have you actually read it? And the reality is, if we choose to live by the commands that are given in the old covenant law, what we're choosing is the present Jerusalem and not the Jerusalem above. And what does he mean by the Jerusalem above? There are other verses in Scripture that tell us what he means by the Jerusalem above. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to the innumerable angels singing and giving praise to the Lord. Revelation 3, verse 12. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem. And then Revelation 21 verse 2. And I saw a holy city, a new Jerusalem coming down from heaven, from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And finally, Revelation 21 verse 10. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. You have a choice between the present Jerusalem or the Jerusalem above. What is he saying? Guys, you have a choice between living for earth or living for heaven. What are you going to live for? Are you going to live with an earthly mindset or a heavenly mindset? What are you going to live for? I think we get so caught up, don't we? I do. And the stresses, the strains, the difficulties, the relationships, all the stuff that happens in this world. And if I'm honest, there's many times in my life where I am so, so earthly minded. I'm only thinking about what is down here. I'm not thinking about what is above. Brothers and sisters, we need to make it our practice to have a mindset that is fixed upon heaven. To have a mindset that this earth, it's not our home. It's not our home. It's not the place that we're going to dwell for eternity. And yet we make all our plans, don't we? We make all our plans for this life. And we very rarely think of the life that is to come. We think of earthly Jerusalem, present Jerusalem, rather than the Jerusalem above. 
And Paul, he would encourage us to constantly think, constantly have in our minds heaven. He said this to the Thessalonians. I want you to listen to it, and if you're taking notes, write down these verses and read them later. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. For the Lord himself, this is an encouragement to the Thessalonians. Listen to it carefully. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with a voice of an archangel, with a sound of a trumpet, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. The Lord, he is coming back. That's what Paul is saying. And so we will always, we will always be with the Lord. And listen to this. This is what he says to us. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Encourage one another with these words. What words? We are given the job as Christians to encourage one another that the Lord is coming back. To encourage one another that the Lord is coming back and to encourage one another by saying this, we are going to be with Him forever. That's our job as Christians. Encourage one another. He is coming back and we are going to be with Him forever. When was the last time you encouraged someone about heaven? It's not in our language, is it? Sometimes, I don't know if you experience this, but sometimes, even with Christians, it's hard to talk about heavenly things. A lot of the time, we get into our conversations and we talk about the mundane things of the world. And look, it's okay to be normal. I mean, it would get really tiring if someone was just always, you know, saying verses every single two seconds and you couldn't just ask them how their day was. Like, that would be really annoying. But wouldn't it be great? I think, I think the pendulum swing is actually the other way. I think we constantly have our conversations on earthly things rather than forcing our conversations back to heavenly things. We need encouragement that the Lord is coming back and that we're going to be with him forever. So what does that look like? If there is a brother and sister that is struggling with their bodily health, what do you say to them? You pray with them, you encourage them, you talk to them about it. And you might say to them this, one day, I just want to remind you, I know you know this, but I just want to remind you, that body, you're getting a new one. One day, you are getting a new one. That's your hope. I want to remind you of that. I know you know it. I don't want to be overly religious, but you're going to get a new one. This is our hope. I want you to, to remind you of that. For those of us who are mourning and who are sad, I think it would be good for us to come close to that person and be sad with them but then also say to that person, I know you know this, but I want to remind you, one day you will not cry anymore. One day you will never weep. I want to encourage you. I want to lift your eyes in this moment above to the heaven above, to the new Jerusalem. Or to the one who is discouraged with their finances. What do we say to that person? Try and encourage them in the Lord. But we try and point out to them and remind them, do you know what? I know you know this, but your treasure is not on this earth. Your treasure, it's in heaven. And this stuff, it's all going away. Build treasure in heaven. Build a bank account there. That's the important one. That's the one that's going to last for eternity. So I'd love if we could be a church who do that who try and press into, and sometimes it's awkward, but try and press into that. Try and lift our conversation and our minds up to heaven to think about the new Jerusalem. Those are the choices that Paul has given us. 
And then he comes to the con- conclusion. And I just want to make one simple point about the conclusion. I'm not going to go through all the verses, but look at verse 28 to 31. All these choices are laid before us. And then he comes to the conclusion and he says, Now you, brothers, like Isaac, the free son, are children of the promise. You're not children of the flesh. What he's basically saying to them is this. You have these choices before you, but if you've trusted in Christ, actually the choice has already been made. Verse 29. But just as at that time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, so also it is now. But what does the Scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. And then he comes to this conclusion, and this is the point I want you to hone in on. Verse 31. So, brothers... We are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. If you have trusted in Jesus, you need to be reminded that the choice is already made. You're not under slavery. You're actually free. You're not under bondage anymore. You're not to live taking things into your own hands. You are to live in accordance with the promises of God. Now, I want to make a strange point to you. And the strange point is this. You see these big numbers in your Bible. They're the chapter numbers. And the smaller numbers in your Bible, they are the verse numbers. And the Bible, when it was written, it wasn't written like that. And if we're honest, the shape of our Bibles... No book is shaped like that. Like, who reads a book with this small writing, with two columns and chapters and verses? We don't read books like this. The Bible is organized in a different way, but it wasn't originally organized in that way. It didn't originally have chapters, and it didn't originally have verses. It wasn't until a guy called Stephen Langton in AD 1227 came along, the Archbishop of Canterbury, and he said, I think this thing should have chapters. So they put in chapters. And those chapters were put in so that we could say, turn to John chapter 3. And then they realized, wouldn't it be good, not only if we had chapters, but we had verses. And so this rabbi, Rabbi Nathan, he comes along in AD 1448, And he says, how about we add verses to the Old Testament? So they do that. And then another guy called Stephanus, he comes in 1555 and he says, well, how about we have verses for the Old Testament? How about we put verses in the New Testament? So they put verses in the New Testament. So that we could say something like this. John 3.16. And everybody would know what we're talking about. Now, why do I make that strange point? I make that strange point because what happens to us sometimes as we read the Bible, we think those chapters and those verses are inspired, and they're not. And sometimes, most of the time, the chapters are really good in their split. But actually, the conclusion of this section, portion of Scripture, is not chapter 4, verse 31. It's actually chapter 5, verse 1. This is the point that Paul is coming to. The whole point that he wanted to get us to. He's talking about all this complicated stuff, but really where he wants to get us to is chapter 5, verse 1, which says this, For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm there. Do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. That's the point that Paul wants to make. That's the big idea that he has for us in this whole chapter. This choice between the slave and the free. But really what he is calling us to do is this. It's kind of like the second direct command that he gives to the Galatians in the book of Galatians. It is this command. Stand firm in your freedom. Christ has set you free. We stand firm for a lot of silly things in this world, don't we? We get into an argument. We get into an argument to fight. And we stand firm in our opinion. I am right. 
We stand firm. Silly things. We're in traffic. We're driving down the road. Someone tries to cut in, and we speed up. Why? Because I'm standing firm. This is my space, and you're not taking it. We stand firm in a lot of silly things. But then sometimes when it comes to our faith, we're on, it seems like we as Christians, we're on shaky ground. We don't stand firm. And what he is calling us in this passage is to stand firm. Why? Because Christ has set you free. And if Christ has set you free, you are free indeed. We are called, brothers and sisters, to stand firm in our freedom, not to go back to our slavery. Christ has set us free. And I think what happens to us as Christians is we often have the mindset of slavery rather than of freedom. And so what I want to point out to you this morning, just really practically, is the difference between the mindset of slavery and the mindset of freedom. And I want you to ask yourself, as I read this out, where's my mindset at? The mindset of slavery is a mindset like this. If you have a mindset of slavery, you constantly feel condemned and guilty. That's the slavery mindset. I'm constantly condemned and I'm constantly guilty. The free mindset says no. I am righteous in Christ and there is no more condemnation for me. Where's your mindset at? The slave would say this, I feel unloved. I'm not loved because I'm always failing. The free person says, I am loved by God the Father and I'm fully forgiven. Where are you at? The slave person, they constantly focus on their past sin and they stay there. The free person constantly focuses on their future hope through faith in Christ. The slave person focuses primarily on their actions, what they are doing, and what they are accomplishing. The free person, well, their focus is on Christ and what he has done and what he has accomplished for us. What's your mindset? Is it one of slavery or is it one of freedom? Brothers and sisters, we're called to focus on our freedom that is in Christ. As so I was thinking of this, you know, thinking of strange things, but like as I was thinking about this, I thought of um, games that I used to play in the playground. So um, games that I play in St. Luke's as well. Um, and one of my favorite games, oh, poor thing, bless her. <laughs> one of my favorite games that I used to play was a game called Stuck in the Mud. Any of the kids, did you play that some in? Stuck in the Mud? So the game I used to play was, was Stuck in the Mud, and basically it went like this. You would, you would run in the playground, someone would catch you, and when they caught you, you'd be stuck in the mud. And the only way for you to be free is if the person, you'd stand like this, and the only way for you to be free is if the person would come along and crawl underneath your legs and then set you free. And as I started thinking about that, I, I thought to myself, I, th I think that's kind of how we live our Christian lives. We live our Christian lives like we're playing stuck in the mud. We're constantly running away thinking we're gonna get caught. I'm gonna get caught, I'm gonna get stuck in the mud again. The reality is, if Christ has set you free, you're never gonna be caught again. You'll never be caught again. You're absolutely, fully, and finally free. And what you can do when everybody's running around chasing their tails, you can just stand there. I'm free because Christ has set me free. And so I'd encourage you, brothers and sisters, live in that freedom, 
Stand firm, thinking of the heavenly place above. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. And we pray, Lord, um, that we would respond to our freedom and praise this morning. Lord Jesus, you have set us free. And so I pray that you'd help us to have that kind of mindset, that we are free people, free indeed, never to be caught again. So Lord, I pray these things in your precious name. Amen.